So the Peter Wells lecture is named after our founder, who kind of sought to speak out where he needed to and share conversations that were otherwise left unspoken. Essa May Ranapiri um, is a poet and um, visual artist. There, Nati Rokawa, Nati uh, Te Arua, Nati Pukeko, and Clan Gun. They're also the author of An Ransack and Echidna, co editor of Kupu Toi Takatapui, and um, Echidna was also recently long listed for an Ockham Award for Poetry. They have a great lo love of language, land back and hot chips, and they will write until they're dead. Um, inviting you, Esther, um, it's a May Ranapiri. It's so fitting because you are someone who speaks and writes to and with past, present, and future. Issa, I love your strength and your boldness, your joy and your rage. Issa, I love your way of existing in and building communities and how your work breathes life into queer and takatapui stories. Issa, I'm so grateful to exist in this timeline with you and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Is this audible? Am I audible? Borderline. Mm, okay. Kia ora. This is better. Cool. I just want to make sure everyone can hear. Um, yeah. As, so as someone who finds it hard to hear when I'm sitting far away from something or whatever, it's it's important. Um. Yeah, I'm going to do a karakia on top of the other karakia, which is maybe weird tikanga, but it's in kind of in the spirit of what I'm going to be talking about um, today. <laughs> um, yeah. E noho ana o i te roro o takufare ka whakaaro noa i ahu mai ahau e hia, i ahu mai ahau i te aha, Yahu mai pia itikuri. Te kore te fifia, te kore te rawea. Yahu mai pia itipo, te po nui, te po roa, te po tahuri atu. Te po tahuri mai ki te ao. Ko ranga nui itu ihone. Ko papatua nuku kei raro. Nga tane i mawehe. Ka tokona ko rangi ki ronga. Kia korowaitia ki te aroha, kia korowaitia ki te maramatanga, kia tehi ake te mauriora. Ka rere ano te ui, i ahu mai ahau e hia, i ahu mai ahau i te aha, i ahu mai ahau i te kore, i ahu mai ahau i te pō, i a rangi i tū nei. I a papa e takoto nei. I ahu mai ahau i te aroha, i te maramatanga, ko te uruponamu ia i anga atu ana ahau ki hia, ki a tehi ake ai taku mauri ora. So, what am I doing? Um, I first just wanted to um, kind of pay respects Respects, that's not, they're still alive. Um, um, to the other people that have done the Peter Wells lecture before me, um, Georgina Bayer, Charmaine Pogni, Cassie Hartendorp, and Gina Cole here, who did it on Zoom last year. And I really enjoyed watching, <laughs> watching the thing over and over again, trying to be like, oh man, I'm fucking dumb. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was really good. Um, yeah, and um, I also wanted to um, kind of bring into the space the ancestors that um, gifted us the word takatapui, um, the Tiarua ancestors, um, 
in the more tutana kai and tiki. Um, without them, we wouldn't have a word for our beautiful queer community, and I am <laughs> forever thankful to them um, and their <laughs> complicated situation. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, a bit about myself, I guess. I don't know. Um, I grew up in Tauranga Moana um, with my grandma, and um, I was born in Hamilton. Um, yeah, and I live with my nan until I moved to Hamilton, moved back to Hamilton in a sense, um, to study uh, creative writing, English, and history. Um, and yeah, I've been kind of doing creative writing seriously since I was doing it in university. Um, and um, yeah, I um, fuck a papa to um, the Scots of Clan Gun, and then I also fuck a papa to um, Te Arua and Rokoa and um, Ngati Pukeko Māori. Um, yeah, and I'm going to be talking about our queer Hene Moana. <laughs> yep, that's fine. Is that it? <laughs> Something wrong with it? Yeah, that's fine. Cool. <laughs> so, sorry. Oh, well, I was just rambling, so like... You didn't miss anything. Um, yeah. So, I'm gonna have to be like doing a like interesting ducking movement to like change the slide. So think of it as like a wave. <laughs> um, yeah. Um. So. I've been interested in Hinimoana for a while. I'm doing like my PhD looking at Hinimoana, who's the Atua of the sea. Um, but I'm gonna start <laughs> with um, <clears throat> this Britannica article um, about, it's like a very kind of Western scientific um, supposition of how our oceans formed on this planet and um, I don't know, I don't understand half of it, but I, <laughs> I wanted to give myself the challenge of reading it out <laughs> in front of people. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting um, because there are some things about it which kind of relate to life building on life. And I thought that was real neat. <clears throat> uh, the huge volume of water contained in the oceans and seas 137 times 10 to the power of seven cubic kilometers has been produced during Earth's geologic history. There is little information on the early history of Earth's waters. However, fossils dated from the Precambrian some 3.3 billion years ago show that bacteria and cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, existed then, indicating the presence of water during that period. Carbonate sedimentary rocks obviously laid down in an aquatic environment have been dated to one billion years ago. Also there is fossil evidence of primitive marine algae and invertebrates from the Idia Karen period. So I'm really testing myself. <clears throat> the presence of water on Earth at even earlier times is not documented by physical evidence. It has been suggested, however, that the early hydrosphere formed in response to condensation from the early atmosphere. The ratios of certain chemical elements on Earth indicate that the planet formed by the accumulation of cosmic dust and was slowly warmed by radioactive and compressional heating. This heating led to the gradual separation and migration of materials to form Earth's core, mantle, and crust. The early atmosphere is thought to have been highly reducing and rich in gases, notably in hydrogen, and to include water vapor. Earth's surface temperature and the partial pressures of the individual gases in the early atmosphere affected the atmosphere's equilibration with the terrestrial surface. 
<laughs> As time progressed and the planetary interior continued to warm, the composition of the gases escaping from when within Earth gradually changed the properties of its atmosphere, producing a gaseous mixture rich in carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and molecular nitrogen. Photo disassociation, i.e. separation due to the energy of light, of water vapor into molecular hydrogen and molecular oxygen in the upper atmosphere allowed the hydrogen to escape and led to a progressive increase in the partial pressure of oxygen at Earth's surface. The reaction of this oxygen with the materials of the surface gradually caused the vapor pressure of water vapor to increase to a level at which liquid water could form. This water and liquid form accumulated in isolated depressions of Earth's surface forming the nascent oceans. Yeah, so that's one story of Hene Moana. Um, there are, oh shit. <laughs> I guess it's blue like the sea as well. I could just go with that. <laughs> How's everyone feeling? We're doing okay. Cool. <laughs> um, so Hini Moana is, there are many stories about her. Um, there's probably as many stories about Hini Moana as there are Māori people. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to be um, reading something from a master's thesis by Tadia Shaman, um, where she talks about the Atu. <clears throat> There is very little in contemporary literature on Hene Moana. Though the stories of the female Atua are usually left out of ethnographic accounts, evidence suggests that in pre-colonial Māori cosmology, there was an Atua wahine for each Atua tāne, which may be a reflection of the need of tāne and wahine to procreate all the different um, kind of energies we bring. Rangi and Papa are an example of this. Hine Rauwharangi is also said to work in partnership with Tāne Mahuta to care for the growth of living things, the forests and the trees. Likewise, the Atua of the sea, Tangaroa, exists alongside the Atua Wahine Hine Moana. Hine Moana is credited with the creation of all the species of the sea, while Tangaroa is said to be the agitator of the seas, while Hine Moana provides a softer, calming influence and even then we could <laughs> discuss that as well. Um, one version of Hene Moana's Whakapapa is shared by Moku Mead. From Tane and Hene Titama was born Hene Rauwharangi, who with Te Kawe Kairanga had Hene Moana. Hene Moana in Kiwa, rather than Hene Moana in Tangaroa, um, birthed Rakahore, rocks, tomata, stones, and eight other children. This Whakapapa lineage clearly shows the transference of divinity through the matrilineal line from Hini Ahone to Hini Titama to daughter Hini Rauwharangi and her daughter Hini Moana. Moko Mead considers Hini Moana to be the critical ancestor from which forms, including cockles, <laughs> eels, lamprey, mallet, sea urchins, snapper, a lot of things people like to eat that I don't like to eat. Um, yeah. Um, and um, something, yeah, oh God, I'm just a bit flustered. Yeah, and there are also other stories of Hene Moana and who Hene Moana was related to. Um, there's a story that she was um, partnered with Ranganui and this made Papa Tuanuku mad, and then vice versa, um, which explains uh, how like, the anger of the waves crashing is the jealousy of Hini Moana. Um, yeah. 
It's just, this is a lot of cool stories. Um, but I wanted to talk about um, Puraco. Um, and this is from <clears throat> Jenny Lee's work looking at Puraco as like a form of pedagogy, as teaching. Um, but I'm kind of just using her description. <laughs> um, yeah, so Puraco refers to stories, um, one form of Māori narratives that originate from our old literature traditions. Our narrative forms include motietia, whakapapa, whai kōriro, and whakatauki, each of their own categories, style, complex patterns, and characteristics. Māori narratives were highly prized, carefully constructed, and skillfully delivered. Pūrāko are often viewed as folklore, an ancient legend or myth or an incredible story were not, however, considered a sheer fictional considered as sheer fictional accounts, invented imaginings, or mere talk. The importance of Pūrāko is emphasised in Māori language. It is not coincidental that the word Pūrāko literally refers to the roots or the base, pū, of the tree, rāko. Rather, it is significant that storytelling derives its meaning in Māori language from words that relate to the trees and bush since the imagery of trees often reflect our cultural understandings of social relationships, our interconnectedness with each other and the natural environment. For instance, Wiramu Doherty, a native speaker of Māori and someone who grew up in the heartland of the Urawera ranges of the tribal lands of Tūhoi, explains that the word ngahere, bush, literally means the ties or binds. The ngahere represents unity, all trees and vegetation originated from the same atua, were interrelated and often interdependent. In turn, the word pūrāko can be interpreted stories that represent the experiences, knowledge and teachings that form the pū from which the rāko need in order to grow or even survive. The base of the tree is usually unseen, buried deep within papatuanuku. The roots draw water and nutrients it needs to provide strength and vitality in an effort to develop as well as protect, shelter, and foster other trees growing in the Nahiri. Um, I want to skip to a part that talks about um, Pūrāko further and how it's relevant to today. Um, oral arts in Māori should provide continuity and inspiration for written literature. Far from being irrelevant, the traditional arts challenge us to create with artistic integrity and seriousness in a manner relevant in contemporary experience and dimensions. And with that in mind, I want to um, talk about a poem called Hini Moana. <laughs> and that's actually many different poems, all with the same name, um, that were all written by queer Māori. Um, one thing that has really stuck in my mind is um, something Lin Linda Tuhawai Smith talks about the um, smallest um, social dynamic in Te Ao Māori is Fano. You can't get smaller than that. There is no individual in Te Ao Māori. And um, so as soon as, when I was given this opportunity, I was like, well, I could just, you know, talk about revolutionary violence for an hour. Um, I could still do that. But um, I thought, why not share poetry from my community and my friends and the people I care about? And I think in these poems, we're all drawn together um, by Hini Moana, the sea. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read through these works and talk about them. Um, yeah, That's, that was all that introduction. <laughs> um, cool. So this is the uh, beautiful, stunning, amazing, intelligent genius, uh, Elizabeth Kirikiri, <laughs> um, who is a member of the Greens, right? Right, that's right, yeah. I didn't just like make that up in my head because it's a cool thing to have happen. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm kind of going 
when reading these poems, I'm kind of going in order of like age, I guess, and then also publication. <laughs> um, and so this poem was published in Sexuality and Stories of Indigenous People in 2007. <laughs> I wish I wasn't that long ago. Um, this poem's called Hedi Moana. And it also inspires the like subtitle of the presentation. But anyway. <clears throat> From the caress of her gentle breakers to the crashing of her deep seas, we rise and fall in ancient rhythms. The spoken ebbs with the tide and comes to lie exposed on the shore. The unspoken remains of Hinemoana biding its time in her depths. I really like the silence <laughs> after poetry. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense for that poem. Um, because in this poem, Elizabeth is speaking to all the silences of our ancestors, right? Of Takatapui ancestors. But is positioning these silences within the Atua Hinimoana. So that so our identities, our history, our whakapapa is being held somewhere. It hasn't just been destroyed. Um, and that's yeah, I really love that. And it comes up a couple of times. This, idea of being hidden, um, which I think a lot of queer people can uh, relate to. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, had my books in an order. There you go. Next poem I'm going to read. <laughs> it's by the also wonderful and beautiful and genius <laughs> um, Henny Moana Baker. Um, who, you know, uh, also has the bonus of being called Hini Moana. <laughs> so there's no wonder um, she wrote a poem about it. Um, this was published in Koiwi Koiwi, which is a great book. <laughs> um, and you should all buy it and read it. <clears throat> anyway. Hini Moana. My face opens into a cavity. I climb the stained glass, four or five hours pass, bright yellow pigs on a wire. To that young man I say, I never do anything in a hurry. He lights his second cigarette, sneezes, sneezes again, a third time, peace is building. I picture the buried horse, red plastic under the concrete slab, singing begins out of a corner. Remember the living spray, high space above our heads, canoe bucketing us through. I am five parts woman and the rest in leaders. My name is the name of the one who drags them under like the nuns swimming their habits, dark shapes on hooks. Aunties enter, performing the how. Beadwork climbs from their fingers. One of us loves to weave wet. The young man says, dries best. <laughs> or the finu rot. Nighttime, fluorescent light. We eat a third of a part key each. Is your name like your life? Tide goes in, tide goes out. My hands shake in the traditional way. <sighs> it's really nice to read other people's poetry for once. It's like, wow, this is fucking cool. <laughs> um, yeah, there's so much in this poem. I like the, like, the, I don't know, 
not really a double entendre, but I like the idea of weaving wit being like kind of gay. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I find it really interesting, the idea that this person has taken the name Henny Moana and chopped it down to, you know, as your, as your life, tide goes in, tide goes out, which I, which I think is like kind of reducing down this very complicated being. And so, yeah, this is response of like, are you serious? <laughs> the handshaking in the traditional way. Um, yeah, and I also love the, uh, my name is the name of the one who drags them under. And that's kind of like the dangers of Hany Moana. You know, she isn't just this soft feminine figure <laughs> um, that she sometimes is depicted as. Such a cool photo. <laughs> I, I took I put way too much thought into the photos I chose, so please enjoy them. <laughs> like especially this one, <laughs> because of the color matching. <laughs> um, um, yeah, this is a poem by Stacy Teague, um, who is looking great in orange, in that picture next to the sea. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is kind of a poem that explores the kind of anger of Hini Moana. In the far spread ocean solitudes, Hini Moana hides herself so perfectly in the fold of the tide. She thinks she would prefer to stay untethered so moves from place to place. Hini Moana is a blue hallway with no adornments. She is a backlit expanse, something to be caught adrift in. Hini Moana is not something to take possession of. She might let you climb into the house of her body, but you will not return from there. Hini Moana dreams of biting down on flesh, viscera, spitting out bone as she goes. Her desire is more likely to destroy than to save. She erodes the land with her wildness only to appear as a footnote in someone else's story. She sees herself in the surface. It gives her pause. She does not recognize herself. A mirror reflecting another mirror. Any Moana begins to notice life growing inside her, a glow in the darkness. When the baby is born, she gives it as a sacrifice to the sea, slips the pink lump into the bloody water like an anchor to the sea floor. Okay, my, fav my favorite line, <laughs> sorry, changing the mood real quickly, but my favorite line is Henny Moana is a blue hallway. I just think it's so beautiful and also like a bit, I don't know, it gives me David Lynch vibes for some reason. It might just be because I think of David Lynch too much. Um, but yeah, and then again, we have this idea of hiding, um, which I think, yeah, it, is this, I don't know, perfect reference to a lot of like the history again of, you know, ethnographers only, only wanting to pay attention to like male artua, um, but then also the idea of like, hiding to stay safe, you know, like the closet is like the main idea of that. Um, and then, yeah, it's all the kind of difficulties of being a queer woman <laughs> um, that come through really clearly in this poem. Um, yeah. And also climate change stuff, which I will get to. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I haven't come here and, uh, um, you know, ignored what's going on in Auckland. Um, yeah, I think I'm moving on to the next one. This is one of my best friends. <laughs> she is very cool. I'm going to read two poems by her. And one has a long word in it, and I can't say it. And um, I feel like she did this on purpose. <laughs> 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 
Hindi Moana is a close and personal friend. Most people don't know that she's an artist with degrees in art history and creative writing, or that she lives in a hut by the sea with walls made of driftwood, or that she, or, and power dangling off strings that rattle in the wind. Most people don't have access to her private Instagram profiles at Henny Momo and at Henny Momo 2, which are really mood boards full of blues and greens and sometimes her face floating in the middle of it all. Very few know I drink soy mocha lattes with her on temp tempestuous nights. <laughs> that wasn't the word, but anyway. And then trade he he he's over messenger punctuated by smileys with 14 hyphens for a nose. I know heaps about Henny Moore. She loves music and she finds the best beats. I'm assuming through the whispered screams of shells because they are from places far away from here and languages that I've never heard before. Her playlists play on repeat. They hover around her like cleaner shrimp, brushing between her kinked strands of brunette slash blonde and nibbling at dead cells so that her face looks perpetually lit. Her shell songs are helpful to me for gauging mood because Henny Moore can be aloof and likes to cut brilliant sentences halfway through to roll her eyes and say, lol, I don't know. She plays, oh, I don't know how to say this either, Uva Le Monde, <laughs> while she drives, which suspends the car lifting and spitting us into the sky, or Prison Colin Sinine Seal Soul, we were dancing, or sometimes she plays songs that sound like a whale crying, oh, eh, oh, eh, underneath the drums and bass. When we listen to particularly depressing tracks, I mime one lone tear streaming down my cheek with her fingertip, and she mimes it back to signify she's drowning, but it's not that deep. When we're alone in her hut, she sings in a girlish falsetto along to disco remix of Air Papa Waiari, and I sing he hornity, lowly and out of tune. The first time I made Henny Moore smile was by imitating the way old Matua sing the end of sentences all dragged out and quivering like, Tauranga Moana. She said that brings me back. Sometimes I tell Henny Moore about my nan who had a fjord between her eyebrows and Henny Moore talks about her nan who she inherited her bubbling giggle from and who lives inside a kinapakira now, she thinks. Henny Moore makes her own bulbous, colourful earrings in the shapes of legs and lips. She paints bodies on glass and assembles her knickknacks and decided chaos like shipwrecked debris. Everything she owns strikes a balance between handmade and high fashion, but her most prized treasures are her friends. They ripple through her hut, and she says I love you to them all, regardless of whether the tide is coming in or going out. Henny Moore likes to drive around the shore at night with her window cracked so she can light fires in her hands and breathe in the fumes. She made clay starfish and strung them on wire to wrap around her rear view mirror so they click against each other and swing cheerfully. Get your license, Kotiro. I'll teach you to drive this summer, she says, because she wants me to feel as free as she does. When we got high for the first time together, we were parked by the flax shoots, watching the rolling waves filling the car with thick clouds, our tongues loosening as the air thickened. I told Henny Moana, She's a Libra, a sun, Cancer, moon, Sagittarius, rising. Ah, yes, she said. And what does that mean? I wasn't sure, but said the best thing about astrology is that it confirms everyone belongs here. Henny Moore smiled, gold eyes squinting, and said, Oh, you're a genius. The thing about Henny Moana is that she has lived many lives. Sometimes I try to get her to tell me about when she was a goddess, but I think she's forgotten most of her time in Hawaii. She knows a little reo Māori, but I stumble on the replies. I say, when I learn it, we can call it all together ne. We shall let loose a theoretical stream of winds in reo Pākehā until we fall asleep forehead to forehead in her bed made of sand. One morning, I woke first and observed her briny hair wild about her head, 
blanket slung around her exposing one shoulder, red lipstick patchy like rotofita, growing around rock pools, smelling like bonfire smoke. She has wiggled scale marks on her forearms and a tattoo on her shoulder of a sun with rays streaming out in all directions, which she got in Argentina. It was one of those things that is so cool it hurts. It alludes to one of those lives far away that I can't ask about. I felt the urge to touch it, to feel the Argentinian sun. I reached out and pressed one finger into the center of the circle and was plunged into lukewarm water. The smell of tobacco, and Coca-Cola mixed with cheap red wine. Henny Moana was flat ironing her hair, the saline burning and rising as mist around her face. I watched Henny Moana work in a kitchen over a hot oven making tamales all day in the sweltering heat. Salty sweat dripping from her nose, the sun sank into the sea and I heard chants in the street outside calling for her. Little Henny Moore ran out into the cool night's breeze to a horde of Argentinian suitors insistent Spanish sentences flowing out of her mouth between puffs of smoke. The men pulled at her wrists, and she laughed and laughed and laughed. But her goldfish eyes were swimming. She found me in the midst of the dream, and she mimed one lone tear tracking over her cheek to tell me it's not that deep. I took my hand away and returned back to her jingling hut, gasping for air. Henny Moore was undisturbed and I will never pry again. Any Moana has pieces of herself all over the world, but I am content to know this piece of her, and when she leaves again, I will visit the shore and sing E Papa Wairi into a shell to remind her of her home, this side of Te Moana Nui Akiwa. The thing I really like about that poem <laughs> is the way Michelle uses Hini Moana as a way to express like love and friendship and community. And it's like we're all kind of um, brought together <laughs> by the Satwa. Um, the next poem is a bit angrier, and it's also by her, and it's called Hini Moana 2. <laughs> Um, yeah. Is this okay? This isn't like boring, right? I don't know. <laughs> well, if you said it was boring, then I'd be angry because these are my friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> God. Anyway, I need water. It's a bit precarious. Oh. That's also why Henny Moana is important. Henny Moana has been alive for so long. We used to spend all our time together, but I hardly see her. Now she spends her weekends dumping pebbles on golf club lawns to jam their ride-on mowers. She, <laughs> she uses pigment she made from crushed soil to paint the words ko te mātoranga he wai no rua fitu outside the beehive. When the rain washes it away, she comes back and repaints it. She neuters all the cats she can find on the street. She takes the stray ones in. What are you gonna go what are you gonna do with all these cats, Mo? Keeping them inside till they die. <laughs> she feeds them stolen fancy feast and covers them in bowels to keep them from catching her kuddles kin if they escape. Henny Moana doesn't smoke anymore, but sometimes she eats hijiki or river watercress with arsenic from local pesticide absorbed into its tough skin. It gives her a little buzz. She cries a lot, <laughs> leaving her skin bleached and pimpled. She's getting smaller. The edges of her are eroding day by day. The cleaner shrimp they used to brush through her tresses are gone. Her head is weedless. I tried to cheer her up by inviting her to a climate change poetry reading once, and she said lol without smiling. Henny Moana is losing her mind. 
She moved her hut closer to the shore so that half is sitting over the water. The inside is wallpapered with greasy newspaper. It took me a while to realize she was buying bedded kahawai and placing it in the moana. Karakia whistles through the sea breeze. The morsels bubble on the surface and attract clouds of gray gulls. The manu circle her hut, and half the time I don't know if it's her or them that are screaming. Outside her hut, Henny Moore has a tiny muscle farm to test bivalve filtering techniques. Last month it was oysters. She wasn't planning on having children, but these are desperate times. Henny Moana doesn't sleep. There have been several eyewitnesses who have said she has punched holes in their windows at night. She leaves with Ponamu pendants, clicking each other around her neck. If anyone tries to confront her, she hisses, land back. So loud, the eardrums bleed. She dumps the reclaimed green stone back into the rivers to be cleansed. There are several columns dedicated to her online, but she hasn't seen them because all her socials were suspended. <laughs> Hini Moana follows the Maramataka. On fetal moons, she stands on the top of the nearest maunga and communes of Kiwa and Te Ranginui e Tune and Papatu Anuku and Hukui Hininui Te Po in the dark shade of night. She never tells me what they're talking about. There was once a time when she fell in love with everything the whenua has to offer. There was once a time when everything felt abundant. If I am quiet, I can hear her in the waves moaning. Please just give me more time. When Hini Moana descends from the Monga, the skies offer tears. One of the things I think is cool about um, evoking Hini Moana is the way that we can talk about queerness and fluidity and all these cool things, but it also enables us to talk about te taiao, the environment. Um, and the idea that even with the waters rising, any moana is becoming smaller is really interesting. Because like the moana is made to be a certain place we have Papa Tuanuku and we have Hini Moana and they're in a balance. Um, and you know, for all sorts of reasons, mostly to do with colonialism and capitalism, uh, that balance is severely out of whack. <laughs> um, and this next poem is by Sinead Overby. Um, and it's kind of, wow, I'm doing a preamble now. Um, set after the end of the world. And it is also called Hini Moana. <laughs> she was under the sea and she was a goddess and she was a mermaid and she was a multi-tentacled thing, tasting your skin with suckers, supple suction, caressing your opal cheek. But really, she was quite normal, <laughs> alone. No one knew where she'd come from or how she'd ended up under the ocean with no company but the sharks and the sharks <laughs> and the eyeless eels suckling deep sand surface and the long whale drones from afar. She was young, maybe 21. Maybe she'd seen the sun before. Not anymore. She glided aimlessly through throbbing coral reefs and rocks and debris, dodging rusty car doors, plastic rings, old telephones, a million messages and a million glass bottles, but she wasn't lonely. Not at all. She had with her a glass box, a secret thing, in which she kept all noises from her pre-water life, the rush of cars on road, leaves sweeping dust from pavement, air conditioners clicking on and off and on, mannish hums of generators, and sweeter sounds like laughter, tiny sobs, a woman singing to herself on her way out the door. She liked to slumber between sunken treasure chests and press the glass box to her head. 
a dream, just for a moment. Dream that her old life and her new life were the same, that she could have everything. But aquatic life is perfect, really. Absorbed in the ocean's largesse, she was weightless, careless, boundless. She liked to spin and fly and go. Sluicing water with clean strokes, feel the rush of plankton pass, sometimes slapping her cheeks like flies. She grew used to the swimming. Her skin sprouted barnacles and she kept going on. And she was now in search of something. She didn't know what. She encountered catfish, dogfish, moonfish, fish with sapphires for eyes, fish with fairy lights sprouting from their gills that had never been discovered before. But they didn't stop her, nor she them. She knew what she wanted, but she had no words. Words were above water still. They didn't matter here. She had only feelings, 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 feelings. And when she got to the very bottom of the ocean floor, where no human had been before, she found, to her surprising unsurprise, there was a castle built from broken timber, chip packets and paperweights with faces of movie stars she didn't remember the names of. Names didn't matter here at all nor money, nor power, nor the flesh against flesh of sex that people killed for, nor politics, nor the constant stream of news, the internet, morals, television advertisements, broken washing machines, tears, police sirens, policies, trophies, sweat, the raging climate fear. She swims into the castle and she finds her mother there sitting on a throne, asks, Mum, why aren't you home? Her mother deals a deck of cards. They play go fish. And it makes her want to laugh, but she shouldn't. At least she choke. So they go and really fish instead. Catch salmon in their claws, torn heads, blood dispersing into sea, sinking molars into flesh. And as they eat, she says, What does it mean to you to be finally free? Her mum smiles shrugs, whispers, you already know. But she doesn't, <laughs> and this fishing is making her tired. <laughs> so the girl keeps on, stopping often to press the glass box to her ear and sigh and sigh and remember the life she's left behind. And she starts to see faded images in water, apparitions, maybe ghosts. Her own memories as clear as day and light, they glow around her, but that isn't what she wants. Painful to remember in full. Painful to think of what she's lost. She would rather just the sounds of the rush of grass, the chirps of birds flying past. When the world ended, she'd been watching birds fly past while lying on a rooftop, seeing the tide roll in and up and over the town, drowning peaks of buildings, and she remembers saying, I'll be fine when the tide comes. I won't drown. Now she swipes the memories from water, doesn't want to see it, doesn't want to know, and moves onwards with the tides wherever they go, but it's too late. She's remembered the past again. For the first time since the whole world died, she becomes so sad, the memories appear, and again and again and again she smells a gasoline leak. Her arms grow sleek with oil black. Her grease hair is stuck to head, barnacled cheek. She begins to sink. The weight of trash and memory and the pain, pain, pain. The glass box falls from her hands and opens and opens and she can hear the voice of her lover speak. One day we will find a house beneath the sea big enough for both of us, and when it all comes crashing down, I'll meet you there. <laughs> um, it's a powerful poem. <laughs> I'm not going to cry. Um, I love the rhythm of that poem and the repetition. I think I'm just going to focus on, like, that kind of thing, because it just makes me emotional. Um, but yeah, again, there's like this kind of 
using Henny Moana to talk about all the things <laughs> that we have to deal with <laughs> as queer Māori. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really beautiful and sad. Um, I'm going to read a poem I wrote. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of lied. I'm going to read my own crap. But um, this was in response to all those poems. Um, and so I draw from that. But then I also kind of, yeah, give, give any more on a, my own spin. I didn't have a picture of myself. I <laughs> So we're just gonna stay on Sinead's beautiful <laughs> face um, while I'm <laughs> reading uh, my poem, um, An Oversight for the World. <clears throat> Hini Moana. Hini Moana reads poetry in the first light of the morning where ducks study the revolutionary text of their shadows stretching through the water like arteries. The lake is as deep as the Empire State Building, as tall, as dark as the Big Apple is, Bright, Hini Moana drags men into the still water. Her hands shake in the traditional way, leaving each body to be weighed down by bullion. Soon the eels begin to feast, black wires bulging. Hini Moana buys an air fryer to enjoy her catch. She's always confused by the phrase, friend, not food, and obviously they're foes for going out. Any Moana makes a face mask out of the ashes of coral. Bits of her start to come away, morsels tugging free of sinew sliding off bone. Now fully liquid, she is ready to leave her house beneath the sea, gone fishing for more bourgeoisie. <laughs> Yeah, so I took like the rev revolutionary edge that I kind of saw in um, what Michelle and Sinead wrote and was just like, I'll go with it. She eats rich people. <laughs> also, I really want an air fryer. I think that was aspirational. Um, next slide. Yeah. What draws us to Henny Moana is queer Māori writers. <laughs> um, it'd be good if I had an answer to this question, <laughs> but I don't really. Um, but I think some of the things, um, I was gonna make a joke about fluids, but um, <laughs> I guess I kind of did anyway. Um, I said I was gonna make three squirting jokes. <laughs> in this um, lecture, but, you know, maybe, that, maybe that's a squirting joke. God. Um, but I think it's just, fluidity is another thing. Um, like, our identities feel so pulled in so many di different directions and different contexts, and, you know, you can often feel like, you know, how people talk about, like, men aren't islands. Well, often you can feel like an ocean. Um, and I feel like, yeah, we're, we're exploring um, all these different contexts where we sit in the middle of these intersections, you know, in terms of, like, the climate crisis and the environment and then also connection to water. Like, we are a certain percentage of water. How, what percentage of water is our bodies? Okay. Cool. <laughs> 60 to 70. So that's a lot. Um, you know, the blood wouldn't move without liquid. Anyway, um, so I think those are some of the things that are drawn, that are draws us to Hini Moana. And I really love this like, kind of mini conversation that started in the absence of having contemporary um, kind of tales about Hini Moana. Um, so I think we can do a lot of good in creating Purako for our descendants to look back on and be like, hey, that's me. <laughs> Um, I, I always make this joke about um, I published books so that like um, queer Māori in the future can like open it up, turn to a page and go, that's cringe, and then close it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, they at least know we were here and unapologetically so. Um, what are we doing for time? So I want to talk a little bit about Ātawatanga, um, which has 
had a certain tradition in regards to looking at uh, Christianity in a Māori context, which is like cool um, in ways, <laughs> you know, uh, being queer, I've had an interesting history uh, in regards to Christianity, but I think there's some really cool work looking at um, Christianity in a Te Ao Māori context. But the way I'm using it is how um, the uh, Takatapu scholar um, Tangaroa Paura uses it. <clears throat> and it's to um, focus on the connection we have to Atua through Whakapapa. And yeah, I'm just going to read this, this short thing. <laughs> Um, that's really cool that um, Tangaroa wrote. Um, they did this uh, thesis where they interviewed heaps of Takatapui and were asking, like, do you feel like you fit in Te Ao Māori, essentially? <clears throat> the consensus from all participants was that negative attitudes to Takatapui have no place in Māori culture. Takatapui are born into Fano and are descendants of the gods Ranginui and Papatuanuku. Despite this truism, the responses from participants show the disjuncture between tuturu Māori beliefs and practices in the contemporary expression. This is indicative in the part we play in contemporary Māori society as the vanguard of change. In our own way, we as Takatapui are challenging the status quo and reclaiming ancient traditional spaces perverted by colonialism. Evidence of Takatapu acceptance within pre-colonial Māori culture is meagre, which is unsurprising given that Māori was an oral language. Literacy came with colonization. However, there are sufficient reference points from the study to establish that Takatapui and their existence in the pre-European contact world was a given. This provides a platform for challenging the status quo today. And I think a lot of what all these writers do when they write about Hini Moana is evolving Hini Moana and evolving ourselves as we do so and bringing everyone with us. Um, and I just think that's really cool rather than like, you know, looking at like the kind of deficit narrative because Takatapui have hard lives statistically. <laughs> like that's just a fact. And it really sucks, but we have so much to offer the world. <laughs> and I think that's what I want to focus on um, for ending the lecture today, is that our writing of our whakapapa and our atua is revolutionary. Um, so I'm just going to finish with karakia, and I just want to thank you all for being here, and thank you for, yeah, it's the same, same, but different for, like, having me here and asking me to be here. I got the email and was just like, why would you want me to do a lecture? <laughs> um, but, yeah, this has been really nice. And um, it's so good to see all your faces. Unahia, 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 ki te uru tapunui, ki a wātia, ki a māma, ki nākau, te tīnana, te wairua, i te ara takata, ko i rā i rongo, whakairia ake ki runga, Kiatina Huye Taki. Uh, yeah, I can just... Yeah.